Thank you, Dave. I was, I'm one of the gentlemen that needed to rest for a minute. I'm going, just heading right up there. Um, la I, I want to mention last week with the, um, our celebration for the Nelsons how um, wonderful that was, and I was on cloud nine for a good couple days afterwards, and uh, I know Lyle and Marge really appreciated it. Um, I was just really proud of, um, of us. I was proud of OCC because I just, um, you, there's this idea and then you think, okay, there's, there's an idea and then it can become kind of a plan. But the whole time you're wondering, is this going to come off? At one point I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't think we're going to have enough food. You know, I had that panic moment and, um, and then it just, everything went, went according to God's plan and went wonderfully. And then we're out there and, um, and then I see just everyone happily, joyfully, and merry, um, merrily and joyful uh, helping out and just um, pulling this thing off. So we pulled it off and I was proud of you guys. Uh, everyone did their part and it was just a very special time. So it, it was a great joy for me that um, just an idea that came to me when, when Lyle told me that his family was, was coming down for a weekend and everyone would be there and they're celebrating um, that Lyle and Marge are now 90 years old. And I said, I want, I want a piece of that. I, w I want to join in that celebration. And, and I think the church uh, wants part of that. And so then um, to see it come off so well, to see the plan fulfilled, it was, uh, it was a beautiful thing. And I, and I had a lot of joy from that. And um, <clears throat> as that's really my theme, joy, joy is the result of a plan being fulfilled. Um, that's, that's what happens. We have joy from a plan being fulfilled. That's really, at Christmas, um, this isn't... Uh, this is part of our joys at Christmas. There's a lot there. This isn't comprehensive, but a lot of the joy is because a plan comes together. Uh, our society is, is so diverse, and that's a wonderful thing, um, but there's not a whole lot that we have in common. Um, and Christmas is one of those things. Even as secular as it is, everyone realizes this is Christmas time. Um, the, the, the street lamps are decorated with Christmas trees. Um, you start to see the, the holly and, and uh, the ornaments come out. It's Christmas time for everybody, regardless of, of your religious beliefs. Our society has held on to this time. It's continued with the plan that this season is Christmas time, and we do this every year. All the stores cooperate. They have their sales, and... And we have Christmas time, and it's one of the things that um, we really hold in common. Remember, we used to watch like a TV show on Thursday night, and it's the only time you could watch it, and then everybody talked it, about it the next day. Remember, everybody, everybody was watching Laverne and Shirley, and they all talked about it. It was, it was the thing, um, and 90210 and others along the line, Seinfeld, and uh, we, had, we had something to kind of connect over. And there's not that many things um, today that we do because everyone's so specialized and scattered and the media is, is all over the place. You can access whatever, whenever. And so one of the things we do have, the plan has continued that it, it is Christmas time for all of us, for everyone. And it's in inclusive. Everyone can join in with Christmas time. And also, uh, it, there's joy as the result of a plan with your family, with your traditions. Somebody has to plan this, this thing, um, and that's a lot of work for them. Um, but everybody has to do a part, has to take part in it. Uh, your family has these Christmas traditions. One of the kids in Monarch, I was asking, what do you, what do you put on the top of your tree? Do you put a star, or do you put an angel? And she said, we put a chicken on top, a Christmas chicken. And then I got the backstory, and it was actually a dove. But a couple generations passed, one of the children said, the 
called it the Christmas chicken. And it became the Christmas chicken from then on. And, and so there's these plans that are for f fulfilled. We, we eat certain things. We, we have special occasions as a family, and, and people plan to be there. And, and um, some people are planning the meals. And so all of those things come together. Murray's family, they have oysters on Christmas. How about that? So um, since I've joined that family, I've, I've, that's become our tradition, and I'm happy I'm an oyster fan. Uh, so yeah, oysters for Christmas. Why not? Sure, we'll do that. And so it's part of the plan. So that's, there's a lot of joy um, in seeing that everyone gets together. There's a plan for this. There's a plan for your family, and it happens, and it's special. So joy is is the result of a plan being fulfilled. And we see here in Matthew, we're, we're looking at, there's only really two Christmas, um, there's two Christmas Gospels, the, the beginning of Matthew, the beginning of Luke, that's it. The other Gospels don't address what we know as the Christmas story. Um, Matthew does, and he takes it from Joseph's perspective. But Matthew, really one of his overall emphasis, his overall emphasis in his gospel is to make it clear that this plan is being fulfilled. Matthew has more Old Testament in it than all other gospels by far and away. I don't know if you remember when we studied Matthew and I gave you a reader and I was trying to do, I was trying to put each one of them in there and it was ex it kind of exhausting, really, as there was so much Old Testament there. And I, and I was really, that was just me, and um, that was just what I saw. And, so, and we were only scratching the surface. There's just so much Old Testament in Matthew. Um, and it's believed that he was targeting a, a Israelite Jewish audience. And so he was trying to say to them, Know your history, know, your, know the word, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms because it's all part of this plan that points to Jesus. Jesus is fulfilling that plan. And so Matthew really wants us, his uh, motivation in, in writing his gospel was us to feel the joy of this plan being fulfilled by Jesus. That's what, we, that's what he wants us to have, and may we have that. And so Matthew starts off his, his gospel with a genealogy, and he starts with Abraham, which goes to show his, um, his Israelite focus. Luke has a genealogy as well and starts with Adam, the first, first person. Um, and uh, so Matthew starts with Abraham, and, and then he goes through up until Joseph's up until Joseph, um, New Testament Joseph, Christmas Joseph. And um, <clears throat> then he, right before he gets into this, the, the text that we have today, the Christmas stuff, he sums up his genealogy and says, there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile, and 14 generations from the exile to Christ. And 14 is, is double seven, and seven means perfection. So 14, so what you actually have there is a triple double because you have three 14s. So that's, he was really right off the bat trying to say, this is a perfect plan. Our God is a perfect planner, and this is a perfect plan. Get in touch with that. And then he goes into this story. Um, that Susie read about Joseph, about Joseph's side. Luke takes Mary's side, and we'll get to that later on in Advent. Um, but he takes Joseph's side. And Joseph is, we don't have the backstory of the romance. We can get that one day. We can ask Mary and Joseph, so, so where'd you guys meet? Huh? How'd it happen? When we did life stories, that was always my most curious um, thing. Travis asked Sylvia out in a grocery store. I was very impressed by that, Travis. I was like, good job, buddy. In a grocery store, boy. He's got some gumption, that guy. Um, and so that's, that's, we'll find that out. But what we know is, is they were in love, and they were betrothed. 
And so here's Joseph, and he's betrothed to the one he wants to marry, and he finds out that she's pregnant, not by him. And so um, he, he, then, he then thinks in his mind. He comes up with a plan, a human plan. And he was actually very kind. It says he was a righteous man. Um, you know, if he was righteous according to the law, he could, he could get her in a lot of trouble. In fact, he, he, he possibly could, if, if full law was followed, um, she and whoever she was fooling around with could be stoned to death um, if he wanted to follow the law. So, but, but Matthew in the New Covenant righteousness says he was a righteous man, and so his plan was to release her, it's the word release, is to release her quietly so that she would not experience disgrace. He could have disgraced her. And so instead, he came up with a plan. And it was a kind plan. But he said, well, obviously, uh, you know, think of his thoughts. She's, obviously, she's not in love with me. Um, I'm not the one for her. And obviously, we're, we can't go forward with this relationship because of this. Um, but I don't want to disgrace her, and so I'll quietly do this. So he had a plan, and it was, it was a reasonable plan. It was a kind plan. He was a righteous man, and he was being righteous and not disgracing her. Um, but it was his plan. And then, in a dream, an angel comes to him and tells him God's plan, which is the big difference, isn't it? The big difference is our plan versus God's plan. If, if you watched some football last night, you, you, you might um, have seen this and uh, David this morning showed me the video, and I said, I think I might use that, but it was the LSU coach, Coach O. And he talks like this, Coach O, we're going to get him Tigers. And, you know, he's this big guy, and, uh, but he was, he, LSU is, is at the top right now, and, and he's the coach. So he's at the top, top of, of the game. And he was, he was remembering just a, his story in just a few years ago because he was, he, he was a failure at, as a coach at Ole Miss and then he was picked up by uh, the USC coach as a, as a positional coach and then that coach got fired and so he was given the interim job but then USC, Southern California said, uh, you're not, they passed over him. He wasn't their, he wasn't their plan. And so they hired someone else, and so he was, he was let go. And then he found himself at, at LSU, and then the same thing happened at LSU, and he was the interim coach at LSU. And he said, I, I probably wasn't their first choice there either, but their first choice fell through, and so he, there he is, made the coach. And, um, and now they, they, they decided to take the interim tag off him uh, maybe a year or two ago, and now he's having this great success. And what he said was, was back, back at USC, his wife came up to him and said, God has a plan. You know, he said, he, he, you can imagine his heartbreak is, is that he was chosen to be the interim coach and he's excited for maybe this opportunity. And, and she said, God has a plan. And he said, he said, it better be a good one. <laughs> it better be a good plan. So, and, and now, and you could see it, I, I've seen his wife uh, celebrate with him, and you could just see it in her face, that she's just, they have been through some hard stuff, and here they are, and, and people didn't believe in, in this man. And so he said, you know, it was, it was, it was God's plan, is what he, he said it was. He said that all happened for a reason, that I am here today to be part of this team, to be part of this moment, and it's special, and it was God's plan. Because if I had my way and it was my plan, I would have been the coach over here, and who knows um, what would have happened. And he said, that was all that made me better and prepared me for today. And so it's God's plan. It's God's plan over our plan. And so the angel revealed to Joseph God's plan. Joseph, you're a righteous man. Uh, you have a plan, but throw that out the window because let me tell you what God's plan is. 
And there's some aspects of that that I saw in it that are that are always part of God's plan. I think we're we're always trying to determine what's I have a plan, but is this God's plan? We're always trying to say what's God's plan? What's God's plan for the next season of my life for this next year? What's what's God's plan? Uh, we get to enjoy this um, this season where where our family plans come together and, and enjoy that. And then we look forward and we say, well, what's God's plan for me? And so this gives us a clue on kind of what, what always is. What, are God's, what is God's plan about? And so the first thing that uh, the angel says to Joseph is he comes up to him and he says, son of David. Son of David. Now, if you just go, if you back up a couple verses and go to the genealogy, you will find that Joseph's father was not named David. He was named Jacob, which is kind of cool because in the Old Testament there was Jacob's, was, you know, Joseph was Jacob's son. So there was some, and they probably, you know, Jacob probably said, I, I have a son. He's my favorite. I'm going to name him Joseph. So, but the angel says to him, son of David. And what that does is it, it helps him think, okay, this angel is calling me son of of David, what does that mean? And it makes him think of, which he knew, he knew. In, in Galilee, the Israelite children were taught the Old Testament. There's, no, there's all sorts of uh, historical evidence of, of this. They weren't rednecks and just in Jerusalem, everyone learned everything. They knew this stuff and they knew their Old Testament. I mean, it's evidenced by uh, the disciples knew the Old Testament very well. And Matthew was. Matthew was the, the tax collector, remember, that, that Jesus called to follow him. So what we see is son of David, and he has to think, son of David, and he thinks, you know what? I am of the, the line of David. The genealogy, he goes back to David. He's of the tribe of Judah and is actually of the family of David. And so what's special about that? Well, God said to David, you will have a son, a grandson, a descendant, an offspring from you will become the king forever, the king of my eternal kingdom. I will be his father. He will be my son. And so for him to say son of David, he's thinking, Joseph is thinking, oh, yeah. I forgot. I'm part of this eternal plan of God. David is my great, 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 great grandfather. And he was promised that one of his sons, someone who came through his line, would be an eternal king, an eternal kingdom. And so it immediately puts him into, and this is what we need to think about with when we're trying to determine what God's plan is, God's plan is about an eternal perspective. It comes from an eternal perspective. Our plans are always about the temporal situation. God's plan comes from an eternal perspective. And it's hard for us to think of an eternal perspective. Um, there's an age of kids when, when I'm at Monarch. I, it's, it's first grade, second grade, where we'll just, at any time, this question can pop up. We'll be reading a story, talking. One kid will raise his hand, her, or her hand. Yes? When was God born? When was God born? They just want to know that. They just, every year, somewhere in first grade, that's going to come up, probably multiple times. When was God born? And, I, and then I say, well... God has always been, and he always will be. Before the earth was born, there was God. Before the mountains, from eternity to eternity, he is God. And then I look at them, and then I experience with them, and when we try to think about you know, I, we all get, and then the whole room, and we all get our mind blown with the idea, because we can't really, you know, 
we take that that's one of those thoughts that just is is beyond us and so we try to think about it and then we have that so it's fun we get this impromptu experience of eternity that just blows us completely away to think no he he was never born he'll never die god has always been and will always be there's no end in fact there was no beginning forever eternity and it just blows everything away so when we get in the eternal perspective let it blow away all the temporal stuff let it blow away all the things that we think are just ironclad obstacles in our life and they can't be changed and we're just stuck and all this kind of thing that that the, all it's like the maze that that guides our human plan like well we can't turn that way because that's gonna and it's like let it all be blown away with an eternal perspective and then he says so he says son of david then he says do not be afraid addresses it right right off the bat the fear addresses do not be afraid in other words you have to live by faith not fear i know you know that i know it too but we all <laughs> i need to tell it to myself constantly um, we cannot, we are not called to, and we cannot let fear determine our choices, our plan. We have to live in faith, not fear. That's what the angel called Joseph to do. You can't live in fear. I mean, he, he had to be going back to, but, you know, even if this is the child of the Holy Spirit, then all these all these fears and such we're, we're not married yet and we're going to be disgraced and and so i don't really want to be a part of that and all these things um, all these fears that crept in and so it's addressed right off the bat do not be afraid do not live in fear live in faith we all need that especially me and then he says um, well, he says the child in you is, is born of the Holy Spirit, which all God's plan is always being executed by the Holy Spirit. Remember, um, in the beginning, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. Even at creation, all creation, everything is the work of the Holy Spirit. So, of course, the baby's born of the Holy Spirit. Everything God does is born of the Holy Spirit, right? And then he says, name him Jesus. Do you know what Jesus means? The name Jesus means. Phyllis? Savior. Savior. Yes, God saves. Salvation is, is what that name means, salvation. We, uh, what's, what's the reason for Christmas? We all say Jesus, and everybody says it, and we're trying to continue to, to work that in, right? What's in, but then they say, okay, Jesus, and what does that mean? So what? Jesus. Because Jesus saves you from your sins. You shall name him Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. Salvation. That's what we're missing in Christmas is why was Jesus born what's the point what does that do because he saves us from our sins he's named Jesus because it means God saves he is salvation for us Manny has a I don't, don't hopefully not embarrassing you but he has Manny has a uh, a, a a bracelet rubber blaze bracelet on his arm and it says save this because and it's for the medical team and and I think we all need to wear one of those don't we save this <laughs> save save us physically save our spirit we all need that uh, save this what does Christ Christmas mean 
that he saves us. Save us. That's what we need to focus on. That's what God's plan is about. That's what Christmas is about. It's about salvation. It's not just, it's not just as wonderful as, as it is. It's not a human plan. It's God's plan. And it's, it's a plan for saving us. It's a beautiful thing. That's what Christmas is about. Name him Jesus, because it means God saves. And then he quotes uh, the, the angel. I love when angels are quoting God's word. Doesn't it, doesn't it give it an eternal sense that this word is even, it's just beyond stuff. Even, even the devil in tempting Jesus quoted God's word. That's how powerful that word is. So he quotes Isaiah 7:14. Here it is. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is written by the prophet Isaiah 850 years before Jesus was born. We, we have copies of the Isaiah scroll that are dated hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years by scientists before Jesus was born. There is no question in the Dead Sea Scrolls they found in Isaiah scroll, word for word, the one that you have in your home. And it says this, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Wow. God is fulfilling his plan. And, and then the beauty of it is Joseph wakes up from his dream and immediately goes and takes Mary as his wife and then names him Jesus. So who's, whose plan did Joseph choose? Did he choose his plan? No. The angel revealed to him God's plan, and that's exactly what he chose. He said, nope, I'm going down this road. It's not my child, but God told me he has a plan, and I believe him. I'm going to live in faith, not fear. God is eternal. And God saves. I'm going to name him Jesus. So he does exactly what he's told, and he starts the adventure of following God's plan. So may we, like Joseph, take that same step into God's plan for whatever it is, for the next season, um, some decision you have to make for 2020. We're always thinking, what is God's plan? And uh, may he reveal it clearly to you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your plan. Father in heaven, you have a plan and you have revealed it in your word and you fulfilled it through Jesus to save us. And you have, and your plan continues until he returns. And so we are longing for you to reveal your plan for us. And we pray like Joseph that we would have the faith to follow it. And we thank you for this plan because it gives us so much joy. In Jesus' name, amen.